Welcome. My name is Gideon Gill. I'm the Health and Science Editor at the Boston Globe, and I'm today's moderator. Today's program is an hour long, and it's a co collaboration of the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Boston Globe. Today, we will take a look at a pernicious epidemic, drug overdoses involving prescription pain medication. We'll describe the scope of the problem and its causes, the nature of addiction, the link between prescription painkillers and heroin, and steps to stem the tide and address the crisis. We'll also hear today about a newly released national poll conducted by the Boston Globe and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health about attitudes towards prescription painkiller abuse. We will take a few questions that have been emailed to us for our panelists as well. You can also participate in a live chat discussion that's happening on the forum site right now. Today's panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Robert Blendon, Professor of Health Policy and Political Analysis at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School. To Bob's right is Daniel Alford, Associate Professor of Medicine, Assistant Dean, and Director of the Safe and Competent Opioid Prescribing Education Program at Boston University School of Medicine. To his right is Michael Botticelli, Director of National Drug Control Policy at the White House, and on my far right is Monica Burrell, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. So to start, Bob, I wonder if you could describe to our audience the poll and its main findings. Uh, for the purposes of our session, we just pick four questions uh, that sort of circumscribe what would be a serious discussion. The first is, do people think this is a important problem? The reason why it's worth knowing that is that though experts and public officials may worry about something, you get a different response if most people don't even think about it. The second question is, do people actually know people with this experience? And there you get a very different reaction. There are the things I watch on television every night I worry about, but it doesn't enter into my life. But if it does, it changes how I behave. Uh, the th third is, uh, what is it that people think is reason for this to happen and what, uh, because it's hard to solve problems that people don't believe it is the reason. And the last is, and I'll just surface too, uh, there's some things that people should know and all the experts are kind of will. Do they actually know that? Is that what they actually talk about about this issue? So I'm going to do this very, very quickly. So first uh, slide is, uh, do people think this is an important problem? And the, and the answer is, it's actually, and this is from our national poll, as seen as greater, greater than the heroin threat in the United States. So if we had had a trend on this, it probably wouldn't have been anywhere like this a decade ago. And so this has really gotten to be in the public mind. The second thing, and this is the most important thing, next slide, uh, that um, uh, I need everybody to remember, the rest is just background. That is, in our poll, four in 10 people said that they knew someone in the past five years who had abused or misused prescription painkillers. What you go down very quickly is, we just then asked them, did it have any effect on them? And look at the impact on family life, work life, and health. And the thing that is staggering to us is that if I knew somebody, uh, one in five said somebody died. Uh, from painkiller abuse. So this is not, I saw it on television or something like that. This is something that actually permeates people's uh, lives. Uh, the third thing slide we'll do just very uh, quickly is what's it due to? Uh, uh, too easy to get it or buy it illegally. Uh, too easy to just keep your pills around and it's prescribed. 
uh, too often. So, but there's a division. A lot of people are not sure. And the last slide is on the knowledge side, and this is very important. So uh, if you were an expert in this, you expect uh, that uh, every physician that prescribes pain medication will have an extensive discussion with their patients uh, about this issue. And what we found is in Massachusetts, which uh, is not the immediate focus here, the majority of patients prescribed the painkiller did not discuss it with their physician the possibility that there could be some sort of addiction. Uh, nationally, uh, it, it was four in 10. No one ever had talked to them or they surely couldn't remember. Uh, the last thing, and it's really very important, there are all these policy uh, proposals sweeping around which say that we should require insurers and others to pay for treatment uh, through insurance. Seems perfectly logical. The people in our survey just didn't know if there was any effective treatment. Uh, so uh, this will be part of the discussion today. But remember, I'm not going to mandate and require people to do things if I don't believe there's anything that works. That is sort of the background for our discussion here today. Thanks, Bob. Uh, to better understand how addiction to painkillers begins, we're going to show a brief segment from a documentary called The Opiate Effect from Green River Pictures and produced by the United States Attorney's Office in the District of Vermont. The full video is free to download for educators, and the link to the films can be found on the forum website. My house is always the place where nobody was there, where it was okay to have parties. It began with alcohol, drinking with friends. I mean, I definitely went to parties and had fun. Just partying, wanting to fit in, just like any other kid. We want to think that there's a logical process that's going on. For young people, there is no logical process. Their behavior is impulsive. They don't think logically through a process. In the beginning, yeah, I got high and it was fun. Nobody ever plans on, you know, going farther than that, but, you know, one thing obviously leads to another. And they think to themselves, they didn't tell me I was going to experience this. They didn't say it was going to feel good. They told me it was bad. Therefore, Everything they've told me about substances has to be called into questions. So then when they take a drug that has some legitimate greater risk, they're less afraid to consume that substance. I already tried this one thing. What's the next gonna hurt? Once I found opiates, that was obviously the last step. You will become consumed by it. It will control every part of your life. There's going to come a day where you're not doing it because it's fun anymore, and if you think that you can just walk away and put it down, you're kidding yourself because you can't. You will lose friends. You'll lose touch with family. There's no control, and the scary part is you lose control without realizing it's happening. People won't like the person you will have become, and neither will you. Dr. Alford, you're a doctor who studies and teaches about addiction, and you treat patients with chronic pain or have become addicted to painkillers. So what's going on here? How do you balance treating pain with the dangers of opioid addiction? Yeah, so when I think back on how we got to where we got, it, it's really not that surprising and a lot of, for a lot of reasons. First of all, chronic pain is incredibly common. It's probably one of the most common things that I see in primary care. And according to the Institute of Medicine report back in 2011, approximately a third of our population, 100 million people, um, say yes, they've had chronic pain. It doesn't mean that 100 million people need opioids or that 100 million people even need any medication, but it's just a chronic, it's a common problem in our society. Um, the other problem is that we've approached chronic pain um, the same as we approach acute pain. And acute pain is a symptom. It's after you have an injury and it's life-sustaining. Um, chronic pain is a very different um, problem, and it's, it's much more like a chronic disease. It's a multidimensional problem, and, and if you're trying to treat a multidimensional problem like acute pain, um, you're going to run into problems. So I think there's been an over-reliance on treating chronic pain with medications and medications only. And take it one step further, we've become very opiocentric in our approach to treating chronic pain. And, and part of that um, is, you know, society believing that opioids are somehow magical, um, that they are the treatment. And, and we now know that they, ne they aren't necessarily the treatment. Um, in fact, we know that patients with acute pain almost 100% of the time will respond. 
um, to an opioid. But chronic pain, it's more like 50% of people will get an adequate response. And so if you're assuming, and, and part of the problem, even with the title of this talk, you know, painkiller, if people are expecting their pain to be killed and gone, um, then they're going to have unrealistic expectations. And they're going to put a lot of pressure either on their provider to increase the dose or they're going to escalate the dose themselves. So again, if it's not working, it's because they're not on a high enough dose, and so they start to escalate the dose. And so I think we've learned a lot about the complexities of chronic pain, both how common it is, but also how complex it is, and how we've been mismanaging chronic pain by relying too heavily on medications and opioids in particular. So I think um, we need to focus more on that. And um, the one last complication when I put on my primary care hat is this is very different than other things that I do in primary care. Um, I use a risk-benefit framework when I treat hypertension or diabetes. That is, I prescribe a medication, um, I look for an objective measure of benefit, decrease in blood pressure, decrease in blood sugar, and I also look for objective measures in harm, uh, maybe a blood test, maybe an increase in, in a blood test that tells me that their kidney function is suffering from this medication, so I have to balance that benefit and risk. When you're treating chronic pain with a medication, what's the benefit? Uh, how do I measure pain? How do I measure function? How do I measure quality of life? And how much of those changes in those domains is enough to say it's working? And then how do I measure harm? What does addiction look like? Um, and I'll say that a lot of patients who are coming to me with pain and addiction don't see the addiction. They just focus on their pain issues. And so it's up to me to decipher this whole thing in a 15-minute visit in a sterile exam room when most of their life happens outside that exam room. So it's a, it's a complicated issue. Um, so I'm in a lot of ways not surprised that we've run into the problems that we've run into. And I think we need to you know, make a lot of changes in terms of how people perceive these medications, but also how providers use them. Thanks. Um, director Botticelli, um, in your role as director of the National Drug Control Policy at the White House, uh, can you describe the scope of the problem nationally um, and how often and why people addicted to painkillers switch to heroin. Sure. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Harvard School of Public Health and the Boston Globe for organizing this event. This is a really important dialogue that we need to continue to refine our understanding of the problem and really help us to refine our policy solutions to this issue. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the two people that are flanking me who I've known for a very long time. You couldn't ask for more committed leaders and expert leaders in Massachusetts in doing this work. I, I just want to start by saying we know that there is not a silver bullet solution to this problem. It's a highly complex problem. It requires a compre comprehensive strategy and really requires all sectors of community to come together to deal with this issue. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the findings and how that plays into kind of the national scope and the national issue. Um, you know, clearly uh, many people think that the non-medical use of prescription opioids is a problem uh, and research from a number of different federal agencies support the fact that there are too many of these drugs in being prescribed and in circulation. Research estimates that 18 billion opioid pills were dispensed in 2012, enough to give every American over the age of 18 75 pain pills. Uh, in 2013, the prescription opioid overdose rate was nearly twice that of the heroin overdose rate. An analysis by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration shows that four out of five people who started using heroin recently did so after using prescription opioids non-medically. So we know that a significant portion of newer initiates started their opioid abuse problem uh, with prescription pain medication. However, that transition from non-medical use to heroin appears to be limited to a small cohort of people. About This study uh, showed 4%, so a relatively small portion are transitioning. And that transition happens over a period of time. So we clearly know we have lots of intervention opportunities to uh, prevent people from transitioning to heroin. Uh, the lesson here is that while heroin is a growing concern, we as policymakers must continue to urgently address the prescription opioid situation and evidence-based solutions. Uh, in 2013, almost 44,000 Americans died of a drug overdose, and prescription opioids accounted for more of these deaths than any other class of drug. And while overdose deaths involving prescription opioids lately have leveled off, uh, those uh, that uh, uh, resulted from heroin use are rising. Among all drugs from 2012 to 2013, heroin had the largest upsurge overall with a 39% increase. 
Startlingly, from 2006 to 2013, heroin deaths increased by an incredible 295%. So we're going to talk about these solutions later on, but it's really important for us to understand some of the challenges and myths that we have about overdose prevention and some of our treatment, as some of the data showed. We clearly have work to do to educate the people that we have uh, uh, important and effective treatments here. Um, in 2013 alone, approximately 1.9 million Americans met the diagnostic criteria for abuse or dependence on prescription pain medication, while 517,000 met criteria for heroin. The rate of babies born to exposed, uh, exposed to opioids grew nearly fivefold from uh, 2000 to 2012. Uh, and from 2009 to 2012, state Medicaid budgets paid for the hospitalization costs for more than 80% of these babies. And really disturbingly, as of May 14th, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found 155 patients with new cases of HIV in one rural county in Indiana. This epidemic has been tech, uh, directly tied to the opioid use. Uh, nationwide data on, on this are not available, but a recent study in Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, and Virginia showed that 70% of newly diagnosed hepatitis C patients under the age of 30 with an identifiable risk factor were people who injected drugs from non-urban areas. Indiana actually documented new HIV cases several years ago, uh, well before the HIV outbreak. But this indicates new uh, hepatitis C outbreaks in people this age are a signal of injection behavior in a community and are a harbinger of increases in HIV. As these uh, statistics indicate, we are truly in the middle of a crisis and we don't have time to wait to bring about change. Coordinated efforts across public health and public safety are essential. The National Drug Control Strategy is a comprehensive plan our office publishes each year for Congress that explains how the federal government is addressing this issue with drug consumption and non-medical prescription drug use. This strategy addresses issues of supply reduction, overdose prevention, treatment, and infectious disease prevention. In 2011, the Obama administration published a prescription drug abuse prevention plan to address the sharp rise in non-medical prescription opioid use in this country since 1999. We have worked closely with stakeholders and professional associations in many states to bring this issue to the attention of governors as well, including Governor Baker. As public health officials, justice officials, and law enforcement officers and others, we have a critical role to play. We have also worked with parents and other loved ones and advocacy organizations concerned with this epidemic. Uh, the plan, the RX plan as we call it, uh, outlines several action items which we can talk about later, but critically education of patients and prescribers, increased drug monitoring, uh, prescription drug monitoring, proper medication and disposal, and law enforcement. We also continue to promote better access to treatment, particularly medication-assisted therapies and overdose prevention efforts. We have made a significant con uh, strides in each of these areas, but clearly there is much more work to be done. I really look forward to sharing policy solutions with the remainder of the time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Burrell, uh, we've heard about actually a rather dismal picture of painkiller abuse nationally. Um, and I wondered if you would provide us with a Massachusetts perspective. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And the forum is really um, such at the forefront of bringing important topics to a national stage, and I want to thank the Forum and the Globe for bringing this topic, because there is no other important public health issue that we should be talking about right now. This is an epidemic, as you're hearing from the numbers, and it's really important we address this head on. So just to give you a flavor of what's happening in Massachusetts at a state level. So this is a problem, as you've heard from Director Botticelli, that's affecting all of us at a national level. In the state of Massachusetts, I'm, I'm going to also give you the, some numbers, and I think the numbers are important because as Professor Blendon's poll showed, there's still a lot of misconception, and we don't, you know, we really need information in order to move to action, right? Because if we don't have the same baseline understanding, it's harder to get to the point of action. So in the year 2013, there were 978 unintentional opiate deaths in Massachusetts. Now, what do you make of that number? Just to give you something to compare that we're used to thinking about, there were 371 motor vehicle accident deaths. So two and a half times as many documented unintentional opiate deaths as there were motor vehicle accident deaths. And behind those numbers, right, so that's just the death, that's the ultimate indicator that we have, but behind that are at least 2,000 inpatient hospital visits 
and over 4,500 emergency department visits. So as we look at these numbers, and you know, they're really daunting, as you mentioned, um, but you know, what can be done? And I, I wanna talk to you just a little bit about um, some of the things we're working on now. So in February, Governor Baker put together an opiate working group, and that is chaired by our Executive Office in Health and Human Services Secretary, Secretary Sutters, and I play an active role and I sit on that. So it's 16 members. And what is unique and helpful about this group is it's individuals from all sectors. So the points where raised earlier about this being a community-wide effort. So this affects everyone in our communities and we'll need, again, there is no silver bullet. So how can we find solutions together to get us to the next step? This working group, since February, we've been around the um, state and we've talked to over 1,100 individuals in open community meetings. We've received multiple emails and written testament, testi testimonies from people talking about solutions. When you sit and hear what people talk about, the vast array of people, it really gets to these poll issues about how it's a vast problem affecting all of us. So we have individuals who have struggled with addiction come to speak. We have the parents of individuals who are not only struggling with addiction, but who've lost their children to addictions. We have grandparents coming. We have siblings coming. We have teachers. We have professors. We have clinicians. We have advocates, people in law enforcement. We have um, judges, et cetera. So it's really a wide range of community members that are coming together to talk about what the issues are and what can be done. And our final report will be out in June, but I, I, it, is, it is remarkable to me that with these multiple different lenses, people are coming to the same conclusions. And those really talk about prevention at the primary level. So before individuals are using, how can we better educate on what the effects of opiate use are? And then on secondary prevention, that when somebody's using, how can we help them after that and really importantly help their families. So the other thing that's really come up is the need for more coordinated care. So, oh, you know, the opiates are an issue that to me is a chronic medical disease when someone's suffering from opiate and substance use disorder. And the way that we have the, the stigma around it is really palpable in these meetings that we've been to. So um, people are embarrassed. People have, you know, the way we've set up our system to care for individuals with this chronic disease is really bucketed in different components of our community that don't speak to each other. So when you are trying to get help, there are parents who come and say, when I found this out about my child that I wouldn't imagine, I didn't know where to go. Now, if you think about that and compare that to something like a chronic disease like diabetes, everybody in this room knows where to go if they need to get their diabetes checked or they think they have it and who should I talk to? But it's so different the way it's set up. So really this concept of different treatments work for different individuals, but there's data-driven medication-assisted treatments that not enough people know about and not enough people have access to or know how to get it and not enough capacity in the system. So that's really an important thing that's come up. And also when somebody's in recovery, how do they get supported in recovery? Because just like other chronic diseases like diabetes, once someone with diabetes is out of the intensive care unit, we still continue to follow them and help them achieve success. So, um, you know, really better coordination over the system in this model of prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob, I want, wonder if I can come back to you and um, ask you about what the poll results are, uh, suggest to you about public policy. It, usually you say uh, seven out of 10, one <coughs> something or other. Our take in this is where people have to understand this problem more. So the, the, the first thing is, if I'm a patient, what should my physician have talked to me about before I regulate what they should be doing? Uh, the second thing is, I, I have a loved one with this problem, what's available? Uh, uh, for them. Uh, Narcan, which is the more used term, uh, we're going to debate whether or not something should be available from a pharmacy or f f first responders. I'm absolutely sure the people that we interviewed had no clue what we were asking. It's just whether or not I'm afraid of drugs, so I want it more regulated or not. So the question I really have for the panel is, what should somebody expect their physicians to do before we regulate them? What would you actually say to a family member could be effective? And, and lastly, what is the Narcon debate really about from a person's point of view? 
So, um, so to follow up on that, um, let me ask um, uh, Director Botticelli. Um, so one of the one of the clear messages in this poll is that one in five people. Uh, so one in five people took prescription painkillers in the last two years, um, and and that's both in nationally and in Massachusetts. And uh, especially in Massachusetts, many were not told of the risk of addiction uh, by their physician. Mm -hmm. um, moreover, roughly half of the poll respondents, as we've heard from Bob, um, were, uh, um, you, you know, or excuse me, uh, roughly half of the poll respondents said that the um, painkillers were pre prescribed either too often or in excessive doses. So I guess what I want to ask you is, do you, first of all, do you agree that painkillers are prescribed too freely? for chronic pain, and what can be done to better educate prescribers and patients? Sure. So, so these data kind of substantiate what we've known a long time, that when you look at the consequence of the opioid epidemic, they've been uh, 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 tracked with the, uh, the increases in pain prescribing. And, you know, we've been promoting a balanced strategy that we want people with pain appropriately treated, but it's very, very clear that they're being overprescribed. And first and foremost, our plan and what we continue to call for is some level of mandatory prescriber education, that physicians get little to no training on just addiction in general, but particularly on pain prescribing. And there was a general accounting office study that estimated veterinarians actually get more training in pain prescribing mm -hmm. than physicians do. So clearly, um, you know, and as both a person in recovery, I have my own experience with physicians who were trying to do the right thing, but uh, were often tried to give me pain medication, which is kind of antithetical to my own recovery. So, so we clearly need to do a better job at making sure that we're giving these medications to people who need them, that we're monitoring this. Dr. Alford has been running programs. Uh, FDA has been supporting REMS education. Massachusetts is actually one of very few states nationally mm -hmm. that actually require uh, some minimal level of continuing medical education for physicians. So given the epidemic, we don't think it's unreasonable to ask physicians to prescribe it. The second piece that I think that you talked about is really uh, true is, you know, to, to continue to, um, and that's why forums like this become critically important so that people are aware of the issues uh, uh, involving these. I think, you know, part of what's been tied to the prescription opioid epidemic is the feeling that they are safe to use because they're prescribed by a physician. So, you know, a, again, there's lots of, inter, uh, uh, of interventions and educational opportunities that we can implement. But first and foremost, I, I think really looking at from a prevention standpoint, mm -hmm. not starting people down this path by prescribing these medications for people who might be at risk or people who are developing problems. Uh, Dr. Alford, can you uh, describe for us uh, the couple of these programs that Dr. Botticelli, uh, that uh, uh, Director Botticelli mentioned, which is the, uh, the Safe and Competent Opioid Prescribing and Education of Pain program uh, that you run, as well as uh, this FDA program that um, for drug make makers regarding physician and patient education. Sure, sure. So <clears throat> the Safe and Competent Opioid Prescribing Education Program that I run is part of a larger national effort um, that was started a couple of years ago. Uh, actually, it had been going on much earlier than that, but it was kind of implemented a couple of years ago, and it was um, put forth by the FDA. Um, and what they, they did is they put together a REMS program, which stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy. And, and they do that for a lot of medications that have risk. And whether it's, you know, the, the medication is going to be hitting the market soon um, or it's already out there and they found a risk that they didn't know about, they ask the manufacturer of that medication to create a program to mitigate that risk. And usually it's patient education and prescriber education. Um, this is unique in that the FDA said to a group of manufacturers, actually 19 of them, um, we want you, and these are, in, these are companies that make extended release long acting opioids. They said, we want you all to pool your money together and fund accredited providers of education like Boston University um, to train prescribers. And the FDA said, not only do I want you to pull your money together, but the content, the curriculum, needs to be based on our blueprint. So the FDA created the blueprint for the content um, and then asked the companies to fund accredited providers to take that content and, and train. Um, and so Scope of Pain is just one of those programs. Um, and it's really geared towards, again, training uh, physicians. Now, there's not a mandate to 
people, uh, prescribers are not mandated to take it outside of Massachusetts and a few other states, um, but the manufacturers of these medications are mandated to fund the training. Um, and we've, we've had some really good success with it and um, we have, for the most case, fill our courses within days, if not within weeks, of promoting it. And I think there's a real desire to learn how to do this better because I think physicians are, are afraid. And there was a survey that was done in central Massachusetts where they surveyed 10 community practices and asked them, what's the number one reason uh, preventing you from prescribing opioids? And 90% said, I'm worried about addiction. Mm -hmm. So it's a fear. There's a fear of addiction. Um, and maybe it's, you know, you know, how do you operationalize that fear so that you can use these medications safely, which is driving people to come see us. And so um, our program is really geared towards how do you assess pain and function and quality of life, those complex outcomes that we're all looking for, but also how do you assess misuse risk? How do I know for any given patient what is their risk of misusing this opioid prescription? And we know that a prior history of addiction, uh, family history of addiction, legal history, being younger than 45, even having a nicotine dependence uh, puts you at higher risk for misusing an opioid prescription. It doesn't mean I'm not going to prescribe it, but it means that I'm going to have a conversation with you about your risk and monitor you a little more closely with the tools that I have to look for misuse. Because oftentimes when people start misusing them, um, they don't even recognize it themselves. And so really what I'm looking for is measuring, looking at their urine drug test to make sure they're taking what I'm prescribing and not taking something else. I'm, we're doing pill counts to make sure they're taking it exactly as prescribed. And we're checking the state prescription drug monitoring program, which is a, a database that the, pharmacy, the pharmacies, when they dispense a medication, a controlled substance like opioids, enter it. So I can look up for any given patient to see um, what medications they've had dispensed from the pharmacy. Are they just coming from me? Are they doctor shopping, going to other providers, um, and so forth? So these are all the tools that I use, and this is what we train. And I think probably one of the most important things that these training programs cover is how to have a conversation with patients. Because you can imagine, you go to medical school to take care of people, and you assume there's a trusting relationship and, um, and back and forth. And when you've got somebody who's addicted um, to a substance, you know, they lie to themselves, they lie to their families, and they lie to providers. And so it becomes a very complicated conversation to, to talk to patients about the need to come off these medications um, and get into treatment. And um, so we, we train people how to do that. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner, I, w I wanted to ask you uh, if you could just talk about the requirement in Massachusetts for doctors to go through training. Um, and d did it surprise you, given that Massachusetts is one of the states that requires that training, to see that so many um, uh, patients who were prescribed um, painkillers said that they had not been uh, advised by their physicians. Well, wasn't a great the, outcome measure. <laughs> the addiction risk. Um, so I think it's very important that physicians are required to do training here now. Remember that the training is around proper prescribing of pain medications in which, um, you know, a component of that is the issue around addiction. Um, and, you know, it's, it is three hours over two years, so I think it's definitely a starting point and I think it's definitely a necessary tool in our toolkit and I think all prescribers should really be promoted to do that at the minimum. Um, so am I surprised? No, because most people um, don't get the majority of their information from their doctor's office. So in order for us to get the message out, um, we really need to be touching in different components of our community as well. Um, while I have you, um, can you explain, we've talked a little bit about naloxone, mm -hmm. uh, or it's also known as Narcan. Um, can you explain what that is, what it does, and describe the efforts here in Massachusetts to, sure, I'd be happy to. to have it distributed through uh, first responders? Yes. So um, when, when somebody takes opiates at a lower dose, the opiates work as a pain reliever. Is that better than a painkiller? Um, so, as a pain, as a pain reliever, um, as a pain reliever, um, when you take it at higher doses, it can have the effect of suppressing breathing. So, when someone is in that situation where their breathing is suppressed, there is a medication called naloxone. Many people know it as Narcan, which can be administered by really anybody. And the way it's administered, it used to be that you had to have a needle and inject it, and the latest form, 
you uh, put on this um, nasal attachment. And just like you would take Afrin or something nasally, you can administer to someone who's unconscious. And what it does is it reverses the effects for a short period of time of the opioid so that the person within minutes, if they're unconscious from an opioid use, wakes up. So this can be life-saving and a really important tool in our toolkit when we're thinking about opiates and especially around the emergent situation where someone has taken too much opiates and their breathing is suppressed. So in Massachusetts, starting in 2007, we began having pilots where initially we focused on injection drug users who were actively using and getting it out into the community so they were able to see how, this was, how they can use this within the community. Then we went to what's called bystanders, and that's really um, family members or friends who could be near somebody who they think is at risk of overdosing so that they can administer um, the naloxone. And in addition to providing the basic training that comes with the naloxone, we also, did we also do education on what opiate overdose looks like, how to do rescue breathings, the importance of calling 911, because as I mentioned, the effects last for a short amount of time, but they still need to then get medical attention. And then from that, starting in um, 2010, we then expanded further to first responders, so police and fire, who oftentimes get to an event, right? Somebody calls 911, they get to an event, and they can tell that it's an overdose, but they have no tools. And of course, as you can imagine, if someone's not breathing, you have to quickly reverse this. So we have 23 different high-risk communities around Massachusetts who are now using naloxone as a tool. We've given out, since the beginning of this program, over 35,000 different kits and have documented over 5,000 reversals. So it's really a powerful tool in the toolkit and um, hopefully can be expanded beyond what it is now, not only in Massachusetts, but across the country. So on that point, uh, Director Botticelli, what, what is being done nationally with naloxone and to make um, it available? So, so quite honestly, building on the work that happened here in Massachusetts, yeah. our office has been promoting uh, uh, the widespread use of naloxone, uh, particularly among first responders. And we've been working with the National Governors Association and others. Uh, we now have over 26 states that have passed some level of legislation to allow a broader group of people to distribute naloxone. We've worked with our partners at the Department of Justice and uh, at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and have issued uh, uh, overdose toolkits on how to do this. Mm -hmm. I actually just attended a roundtable of fire chiefs from around the Metro Boston area who are very interested in following on a number of, of fire chiefs to administer naloxone. Mm -hmm. This is, again, is an incredibly important tool uh, that we've seen. I think first responders play a critical role um, because in many parts Parts of the country, we know that the issues around prescription drug and heroin have been particularly hard hit in rural and suburban areas. And so particularly first responders can play a critical role here in making sure that we're re 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 reversing overdoses in parts of the country where we don't have other infrastructure, where we don't see treatment programs, where we don't have other outreach programs. So they play a critical role. And, you know, and I have to say, you know, we've seen a tremendous and surprising uptake by uh, law enforcement and other first responders around the country. They have really stepped to the table in very dramatic ways and in very compelling ways uh, to administer naloxone. The second piece, and I, I say this, that we have seen a tremendous amount of partnership between law enforcement and public health, that mm -hmm. not only do they want to reduce overdoses, but they're looking at ways to partner with the treatment community uh, and the recovery community to use those as intervention opportunities to get people into care. So they understand the significance of not only of saving someone's life, but using it as an intervention opportunity and follow up to get someone into care. Do you see, do you find reluctance on the part of law enforcement in some places to engage with this in that some view this as encouraging uh, op uh, illegal opioid use? Uh, remarkably little, I have to say, uh, remarkably little. And, and I think for a couple of reasons. One, um, that many of uh, these law enforcement have had, as your data show, personal experience with people in their community who have died. Um, and I think that that has fundamentally kind of changed their attitude and see themselves as part of the solution. I, you know, I also think building on the work that happened here, we have incredible champions in the law enforcement 
enforcing community who've been able to talk about mm -hmm. this. Uh, and, and I think people understand fundamentally this is not about enabling, that this is about saving someone's life mm -hmm. and that um, we have a responsibility just like we do if someone has a heart attack to save someone's life regardless of whether or not they choose to be compliant with treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, we don't predicate saving someone's life for other diseases based on their willingness to be compliant with treatment. We save their lives because their lives are worth saving. And so I think we've seen a tremendous amount of support for, uh, uh, for the, these kinds of efforts. Thank you. Um, so as we've heard, um, the, the poll found that many people, uh, the majority of people, don't, um, don't know uh, uh, about effective treatment um, for uh, pain reliever addiction. Uh, and so, uh, Director Botticelli, uh, <laughs> if you could uh, talk about what, so what are the facts about treatment? So, so first of all, I, I think it says a couple things. That, that one is, we, we really have to promote the other side of the equation and that we really have to hold up people in recovery and really share their voices because part of what we want to do is make sure that people understand there is hope and life and joy on the other side of addiction. That stigma still plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. The data are uh, surprising in the sense of that we do, if there is a bright spot here, we do have highly effective medications for the use of opioid disorders that have been shown to be more effective than any other treatment that we have here. These, however, are tremendously underutilized medications. They are underutilized in our treatment system, in our criminal justice system, and uh, we have an opportunity to really build on the uptake of these medications along with other behavioral therapies. And that's been a big part of our federal effort to increase funding and to really require uh, our, our federal grantees to use these highly effective medications as part of their treatment regimen. Okay. Dr. Alford, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think historically we've held treatment for addiction to a different standard than um, treatment of everything else that I do in primary care. That is, if I put somebody on a treatment and they get better, um, I say the treatment's working. And if I take the treatment away and their problem becomes, you know, reoccurs mm -hmm. and gets bad, I say that treatment really worked. But with addiction treatment, you, you put somebody on treatment, they get better, you take the treatment away, and it stops working, and people say the treatment didn't work. Um, but really, the treatment did work. It's just you took it away. And so I think people need to understand. <laughs> people need to understand that you know addiction treatment needs to be long term, mm -hmm. and whether it includes medications or not. Um, you know, again, wearing my primary care hat, I know that there are lots of different medications I use for treating hypertension and diabetes, and I wouldn't say that you know one is absolutely the be better than another. It's individualized. It depends on the person, and, and there are other comorbidities. Um, so I like to keep an open mind with addiction treatment too. I mean, there are some people who do very well with, with medication and some who do very well without medication. Uh, and so I think it's important for our community to understand that, that it's, you know, there are lots of different treatments out there and some work for some people and not for others. Do, um, we've had some mention of the prescription drug monitoring program and I wondered, uh, Commissioner Burrell, can you talk about um, what that program does and um, how it uh, works here in Massachusetts. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I spoke earlier about the um, importance of data and having an understanding before we go to action. And another component of having data is this prescription monitoring system. And again, um, you know, I was just thinking as folks were talking about this, you know, the really the underlying currents here is <coughs> stigma and segregation to me. So there's segregation of components and care. And it's really this undercurrent of stigma and how we as a society think about this chronic disease versus any other one that we treat. So just to put that out there. So as we're talking about the prescription monitoring system. So in Massachusetts, we have a prescription monitoring system in place that we've had for several years. And um, several months ago, I used it as a clinician. So what it is, is that when you have a patient sitting in front of you, there's a database that you can look. So John Smith comes in and wants a medication. I can then on my computer screen look up and see which opiates he has received in the last 12 months. So this has become a very powerful tool in the doctor's office to be able to see what other prescriptions were given. 
Um, the way that the system works is that it's throughout Massachusetts and any patient receiving any prescription with an address in Massachusetts, so even if they get the prescription out of state, is in the system. So it's this huge database of information. It also is connected to the pharmacy, so the pharmacies have the same information, and is meant to be, again, another tool to make an informed decision around whether or not the person sitting in front of you is struggling with addiction or needs pain meds or where else they're getting their prescriptions. So um, we have had, there, at this point, all physicians are required to be on the system and connected to the system, and 79% of physicians are, and it's a requirement related to their license. So eventually we'll have 100%. Um, and our next step is to make it more user-friendly because the end user experience is still inhibiting individuals um, from using it more actively in their clinical flow. So um, it's really become a good way for individuals to get notification and for pharmacies so that they can yet then use that piece of data to inform what they're doing. Speaking of data, do, do you know what percentage of physicians are actively using the database? Yeah, so that's a good question. So in the way the current um, prescription monitoring system is set up, it's probably about 20 to 30 percent. The problem with that number, though, is that we don't have the denominator because not every physician who signed up, it's mandatory to sign up, is actually prescribing opiates. So we hope um, we're going to enhance our um, prescription monitoring system in the next few months and hope to have a more sophisticated way to accurately report that. Part of having individuals use it more, though, is to have it be more user-friendly, which is one of our primary things that we're working on now. Uh, Director, do you want to talk about nationally what's happening sure. with these programs? Um, so uh, th I think this underscores what the commissioner is talking about. So uh, a big part of our strategy has been uh, to increase um, the prescription drug monitoring programs and its uh, uh, utility. So in 2006, I think we had 20 states that have prescription drug monitoring programs. And as of today, we have 49 states in the District of Columbia. Missouri is the last holdout. Uh, um, uh, and um, I won't talk about why. Um, but uh, so part of what we're doing is not just that we have these programs operational, but to the commissioners point, we have been working at the federal level to make sure that these programs can talk across state lines. Mm -hmm. So interstate operability has been a, a big goal. We've also been working on ways and pilot programs to increase the utility and usability of these programs. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with the Office of the National Coordinator on how do you link these programs uh, to electronic medical records and health information exchanges so that physicians and prescribers don't have to kind of log off one system and log on another. That's a normal part of the record. You know, let me just say too that we've seen where these programs have been implemented where we have robust prescription monitoring programs and where they're used, we've seen some tremendous success in the reduction of people who are going from physician to physician. And actually Florida, which was kind of the outlier state to begin with, had significant reductions in uh, prescription drug related overdose deaths when these programs and other things were implemented. So again, it's one part of a large strategy. The last thing I'll say is I think we still have opportunities to look at how do we train physicians that when they're identifying someone who might be going from physician to physician to not just cut people off from these medications and again, use those as an intervention opportunity and a referral for treatment. So we have some uh, questions from our online audience, uh, Lisa. Yes, thanks Gideon. And we have an active chat going on online, so I encourage everyone to go on that as well. Here's one related to prescription monitoring. Many states are encouraging the use of electronic prescribing of controlled substances, EPSC, to prevent fraud and theft related to prescription drugs. Early reports indicate that it is having a positive impact, but adoption of EPCS varies by state and is very low overall. What is the panel's view of this strategy? Shouldn't we be focusing on this as well as the prescription monitoring programs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, yeah, I, I'll start. Uh, actually, that has uh, when we were, that was one of the strategies that we identified uh, in the plan. We think there is significant opportunity here to increase uh, e-prescribing as it relates to uh, 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 safe and kind of not fraudulent use of these. Uh, we've been working with the. Uh, uh, Drug Enforcement Administration in terms of looking at kind of regulations as it relates to enhanced deprescribing. So, you know, again, we do we do see opportunity there uh, around uh, uh, increasing e-prescribing as a, as a, a good strategy here. Commissioner, did you want to? 
Um, no, I, I agree with Dr. Botticelli that it would be incredibly useful. The, um, you know, the issues around interoperability mm -hmm. and EHR, we're also looking into those in Massachusetts to see how we can move forward. Great, thanks. I know we just have a little time left. I'll take a few more. I've been learning a bit about abuse deterrent technologies for painkillers to help stem the tide of addiction. For example, making painkillers that have features that prevent the drugs from being snorted or chewed. Isn't the FDA involved in developing new regulations around this? And do you think these new technologies hold promise? Okay. Yeah. I'll okay. Yeah, so I think we've, we've learned some lessons about extended release long-acting opioids where, you know, they're, they're essentially short-acting opioids, but they're packaged in a way that when you ingest them the way you're supposed to, that is swallow them, there's a slow release. So you get 12 hours worth of relief as opposed to four hours. Um, the problem being that you have to put a lot of molecule in that tablet in order to get that 12 hours of relief. And if, if you crush it and snort it, you get a, a lot of short-acting, and that becomes very rewarding and, and very addicting. Um, and so as a result of that, a lot of the manufacturers of these uh, medications are creating formulations that are much harder to crush. Uh, or if you do crush them, they become like a gel, so you can't sniff it or you can't inject it. Um, and so these are great. These are great technologies. But my teaching to um, you know, providers is to, to never you know, really let your guard down, to always assume that someone's going to figure out how to um, how to misuse it, if, uh, because you know, fundamentally, the medication has to be metabolized within the body in order to get the active drug. So I'm sure there's a chemist out there somewhere who could figure out how to bypass any of these. But I think it's all good, and I think um, we've seen that as a formulation becomes more abuse deterrent or resistant, um, people are much less likely to misuse it and go for some of the easier ones. Um, so, and, and the FDA's role is really, um, creating criteria whereas the manufacturers of these medications um, in order for them to prove that it's abuse resistant because you, as you can imagine they're putting these medications out there and saying it's abuse resistant but yet it hasn't really been out there so you don't really know so there are criteria as to what needs to be um, satisfied in order to call it an abuse deterrent. Great. Well, we've also had some questions about alternative drugs that aren't opioids so um, let's take one of those. There are drug options for controlling pain that don't involve opioids, but they cost more than current therapies, I believe. What can we do to incentivize researchers and pharmaceutical companies to develop these alternative medications and make them more affordable? Maybe I'll start in the yeah, sure. so, so part of the work of the uh, NIH and NIDA has really been to amp up research to really focus on non-narcotic uh, uh, analgesic pain therapy. So clearly we know, you know, as Nora Volkov talks about, that we actually really don't have a great kind of armamentarium of good pain management, particularly for chronic pain, and that's work that we have to do. So, so there's clearly an opportunity to do that. But one of the things, and again, this is where the all sectors come together. One of the things that we've heard from physicians that we have to continue to focus on is often they don't want to prescribe uh, narcotic analgesics, but often insurers won't uh, pay for things like acupuncture and massage therapy mm -hmm. and physical therapy. So how do we incentivize insurers and others for physicians who and patients who don't want to take narcotic analgesics but need some pain relief. So I think clearly there's opportunities as we go forward to think about how we incentivize not just the research but the practice around kind of pain management. Yeah, the, the one other thing I'd like to add is when, I, when I'm managing a complicated disease um, or a patient with, with a complicated form of diabetes or hypertension, there are specialists that I can um, call upon to get a consultation. Um, the field of pain medicine is fairly new, and there aren't enough pain specialists out there who I can rely on to get consultation. And so not only do I not have these other treatment modalities available to my patients that I can then refer them to, but I also don't have specialists readily available either to get help. So it really is reliant on the primary care population, um, the primary care providers who, who haven't been adequately trained yet. <laughs> That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of other questions, so again, please go online. Um, but I want to give time for the final statements. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Lisa. So, um, yeah, we, we need to wrap up. So, un unfortunately, we could talk for hours about this. Um, so, I wanted to a um, ask each of you to identify or recommend a policy takeaway. Um, that uh, the, the one thing that you think um, viewers really need to take away from this discussion. Uh, Bob? 
Do you want to start? Uh, so surprisingly, it's a little bit different. It relates to director Botticelli. <laughs> so the, uh, the critical issue, four in 10 people know someone who is in this situation of abusing and misusing it. Uh, the critical thing, I believe, is many of them would try to intervene more if they were convinced there were, really was a way there could be a recovery community. Mm -hmm. This issue of hope at the end of the line, uh, so I'm all for making sure physicians give you this, but a lot of people know somebody in their life, and the question is, could they push them, direct them, cost their family, because there really is hope at the end of the line, or this is something that's going to drag on. So my policy recommendation is we need more of you on the hope uh, <laughs> side, because this is really important about how people respond to people they know. Yeah. So, so th thank you for saying that. And, you know, we see that as an import important function of our office. Um, you know, I, I'm the first person to hold this position who uh, comes from a public health background. I've been in my recovery myself for 25 years. So, and we use our office to talk about that. We actually just hosted the first uh, uh, recovery event at the White House uh, last year. Um, there are people in this audience who have uh, had lifelong efforts to put a face and a voice to people uh, with recovery because it really is clear. Um, we, we need to show hope on the other side because uh, why would someone seek care if they didn't see a life on the other side? Dr. Alford? Yeah, so I, I just want to um, uh, alert the policymakers um, when they're thinking about you know, creating fixes for this problem that easy fixes um, oftentimes have unintended consequences. And so though, mm -hmm. though I think they're all well-intentioned, that is, you know, there are states that have put limits on the milligrams of um, opioids that you can prescribe or the duration. Um, and that absolutely will decrease the amount of opioids that are being prescribed, but it also puts the people who have chronic pain who might be benefiting from these medications at risk as well. And they also don't have a very unified voice. And so I would just say that any kind of easy fix um, should really be thought about in terms of is it too blunt of an instrument that I'm going to adversely affect people who might be benefiting. Um, but there's no question that the pendulum around opioid prescribing has swung way too far to becoming, you know, we're too opiocentric, but I don't want to swing it all the way back where, where people are being undertreated for their pain. Thanks. And uh, Commissioner? Um, so I think that um, really this is going to take a broad audience of us and a multi-sector approach to look at this multi-pronged problem with solutions in prevention, intervention, um, treatment and recovery, but really um, focusing at this intersection that we've spoken a lot about today of medical care and public health care, where we're looking so at some specific things we can expand that we know work, because the evidence is there. So education, expanded education, the uh, prescription monitoring system, Narcan use, and more availability of medication-assisted treatments and supporting people in, in recovery. I think for all of you, I have a request, which is around uh, we need everybody in our community to think about this as an integrated problem and the issue of stigma. Um, we really have to overcome that in order to come to positive solutions to, together. So thank you for being here today because I think that's a really important part. Thank you. Director, did you have any other, was there anything else you were going to add? Or yep. Okay, good. So uh, thank you all uh, for um, joining us for this event. Thank you very much to our wonderful panel for your incisive comments. Uh, those of you who are online, I encourage you to continue the conversation on the forum website, which is forumhsph.org. Um, thank you very much and have a good rest of the afternoon.